Hi guys, welcome back to another tutorial on Apache Cassandra. In this fifth tutorial, we will start looking at the basic data modeling in Cassandra and how this varies from a traditional database. So far, we've set up Cassandra on our machines, but we haven't actually got into the thick of things on how Cassandra works and writing actual Cassandra queries. So we should get to that in the next couple of tutorials and get you up and running with Cassandra. In the traditional database, there are usually database tables which represent entities in the real world. In this example, which I've done up in Microsoft Excel, we have an employee table, which represents an employee in the real world, and a company car table, which represents a company car in the real world. So that's called relational modeling, where every table in your database represents a real world entity, and we tie these tables together using relationships. Every table has a number of columns, in the employee table, for instance, we have the ID, first name, surname, company, car ID, and salary. The ID here is the primary key, which means it uniquely represents an employee. An employee is represented by a row in the database. It's also interesting to note, the company car ID here is a reference to the other table. So company car ID here, one, means that Elvis Presley drives a BMW 5 Series. That's what's known as a secondary index. And one of the most common features of a relational database is that we use joins in our queries. So for example, if we want to query which people drive BMWs, we'll have to use this table joined with this table, and we will join them on this secondary index where this ID represents this ID. So joins are good when our database is running on a single machine, but in a distributed database where our data could be lying across multiple machines, joins are not very efficient because they require a lot of locks, which means we can't service other requests. So a single transaction or a single request to the database could actually end up tying up multiple machines on our cluster at the same time, and we wouldn't be able to service very many requests. So for a system where high throughput is required, this kind of model doesn't always cut the mustard. Cassandra gets a lot of its speed in database reads and writes from the fact that it never has to perform any joins on the database. In fact, in Cassandra, it's impossible to perform joins. Instead of taking a relational model approach, we take a query first approach. So this means we design our tables for a specific query. So rather than flexible tables, such as this employee table and this company car table, we want to have every table which is catered for a specific query. So this means we only ever have to query one table when we're reading data. And when we're writing data, we just write it to the table or tables we want to write. Obviously, there are some consequences with this approach, as we might end up writing the same data to multiple tables just to satisfy different queries. But it's ideal for Cassandra's distributed architecture and means only one table is ever needed to be queried for a request in a distributed system, such as that which Cassandra is designed to operate in. So Cassandra tables have to be designed for the query. If a table is not designed for a query, then either the query will not be possible to perform or it will be very slow and unperformant. So we need to be careful when we're modeling our data in Cassandra to make sure the tables we have set up will satisfy the queries that we think we're going to need to make. And this seems like a bad thing, but in a lot of databases that are under high load, we end up doing this anyway in a process called denormalization. We're often in relational databases. The tables we have reflect the queries anyway. So if we take a look at the query first approach of what these tables would look like in a relational database, we can see here that we now have two different tables reflecting the two queries we want to make. We want to make the get employee by car make and get company car by ID. So this first query represented by this table here represents the join operation we are performing in the first part of this video. This will allow us to quickly get all the car makes for the employees that drive that particular car make by only querying one table. In a big data world, this can lead to great performance gains. The second table is the same as the table in the relational design. Company car is the same as company car by ID. Cassandra and the query first approach will still support getting a company car by ID if the table is there to support it. Finally, we can look at how these tables might be implemented in a Cassandra database. We can see that the two tables are supported and the table name is the same as in the query first approach in a relational database. However, we can now see that we've taken a columnar database approach where every 
column has its key and its value for each row. We can also see that every row has its partition key in Cassandra, and that is something we will look at next video, what the partition key is used for and what benefits the partition key provides. It's also important to note that based on our first video and our knowledge of Columnar databases, that we can make some savings in data storage. For instance, we can reduce and compact these fields here into BMW by three. As we know, the next tree will all be BMW, Audi by two, and Mercedes by two. And this saves us some space in our database and can lead to more efficiency. So even though often we duplicate data by different tables, performing different queries on the same data, we can still save some room by the columnar database design. We can also have empty columns for some rows. So some people might not have a surname, other people might not have a salary, and that will be supported in our database design. So some of the most important things to remember when beginning with Cassandra and beginning data modeling in Cassandra is that we should always take a query first approach to our database design. Our tables should reflect the queries we are trying to make. It's also important to note that if we need to perform queries that we haven't supported in our data model, it may be hard to do so or in to do so. However, even with the apparent downsides of the Apache Cassandra database model, these can lead to huge gains in performance, throughput and storage space in a distributed system. While an SQL or while a relational database might be a better choice for small scale data in a single machine on a single data center, Apache Cassandra comes into its own when we need to store huge amount of data, when we're writing huge amount of data and when we've got a huge amount of clients and that's when it's most appropriate to use. So thanks for watching the video guys. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel or give the video a thumbs up. If you have any comments, please leave them in the comment section. In the next video, we'll look at how Cassandra stores data on its nodes. So how Cassandra decides what data is stored on what node.